So hi again, everybody. It is wonderful to see all of you. Some of you are not, I don't see your faces, but you are signed in. So there you are. Is that Dolly? Very good. Good to see you. And uh, everyone turn your videos on. And now I'm going to um, mute all of you for just a little bit, because today we're going to talk about Rembrandt. Okay. Um, let me share the screen. And this is our artist of the day today. So there we are. So uh, we are talk going to talk about Rembrandt. He's again, another genius, a genius of, he was a Baroque style painter of the Dutch golden age. Do you know what a golden age is? A golden age is when a country is uh, really progressing and is making a lot of money. So in, during this era, during Rembrandt's time, the Dutch people were very productive and they were very, very successful, okay? So Rembrandt was a draughtsman, a painter, and a printmaker. A draughtsman is a person who draws a lot of things, different things they can draw. And he, so a lot of people work on just one uh, subject matter, right? Some people are sculptors, some people are landscape uh, makers, some people just make flowers and so forth. But Rembrandt, he was a genius and he worked on every single style and every single subject matter. It didn't matter what it was. It could be biblical, <clears throat> meaning stories from the Bible. It could be a landscape. It could be historical scenes. It could be mythological, like myths, you know, like stories from that have been passed down generations. It's just a myth, okay? He uh, did animal studies, still lives, and so on. So this is what he was. And he was not just a painter. He also was an art collector and an art dealer. Okay? Now, some people collect things, but then they collect a lot of things beyond what they can afford. And Rembrandt one, was one such person. He just would go and buy all these knickknacks, and he spent all his money living large. <clears throat> That's one thing you should do because you should try to live within your means, meaning whatever money you have, try to live within what you can afford, right? Otherwise, you'll lose all your money and you'll become like a pauper, you know? And that's what uh, Rembrandt went through a lot of trouble because of his crazy spending habits, okay? But he collected a lot of things. So where was he born? He was born in Leiden in the Netherlands on July 15, 1606. And he always stayed in the Netherlands. He didn't go abroad, okay? He died in France. He died in France, then why did I say he never went abroad? I'll have to check that. So uh, he died on October uh, 4th, 1669. So I'll have to check about this, his death, okay? <clears throat> so wh where did he study? He went to the University of Leiden. Now people in the US, when do we go to university? When we are about, about 18 years old, 17 or 18, 19 perhaps, uh, if you started school a little late. But he went to university at the age of 14, okay? And he studied art under Swannenberg and Lastman. So with Swannenberg, this guy right here, you know, he spent about, he was there for about three years. Last month, he studied for about six months. And then what did he do? <clears throat> Excuse me, my this is, uh, cracking. So what did he do? He went off, now he was very young and he became like a artist at the very, very young age of say 21, 22. And his first student, was when he was 22 years old. And he moved to Amsterdam in 1631. But you know, one of the things that happened in his life very early on was that a statesman by the name of Huygens found him. And he was a statesman, meaning like, supposing you 
um, you know, you know how we have representatives and congressmen and senators. So this guy Huygens was like a senator, you know, and he found Rembrandt and he introduced him to royalty. So Prince uh, Frederick uh, was so impressed by Rembrandt that he started buying his paintings long till about like 1646. He just kept buying Rembrandt paintings. And so because he was with royalty, Rembrandt made a ton of money. Okay, so it's very nice if somebody good, like supposing you become a painter or you become a scientist or something, if they're a mentor or like a patron that you have, then you made it, right? So that was one thing that happened. So let's look at some of the famous paintings of Rembrandt. So this painting, Night Watch, made in 1642. And you can view it in the Riggs Museum in Amsterdam. Okay. So why is this painting? This is actually the fourth most famous painting in the world. So can you tell me? I've told you about all the famous paintings by now. Can you tell me what is um, uh, the most famous painting? Anybody, I'll unmute you. Anyone, do you do you remember? I told you about- Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa, yes. Mona Lisa. Very good. And Mona any Lisa. other uh, any other paintings you can remember? I knew it. Awesome. Huh? Picasso. Picasso, yeah, but he's not the most famous yet, okay? So uh, the Sistine Chapel is one of them. And the Last Supper by Vinci is another Last one. Last Supper. Yeah, so we know these four famous paintings, Mona Lisa, uh, the Last Supper, the Sistine Chapel, and now we know that the Night Watch is a famous, famous, meeting uh painting okay fourth famous so i'm going to mute all of you and uh yes i want to mute everybody okay so this painting is huge it's huge okay it's 11 by 14 feet huge it's like uh for it was made for a big hall okay and um uh, uh there is like in this painting I'm going to introduce some new words to you. One is, this is called tenebrism. What is tenebrism? Tenebrism is that there is, if you, what do you, you look at this painting, you think that there's light on the painting, right? There's illumination. So Rembrandt was known for these kinds of paintings. He just would paint everything else dark in the background. Okay, see, it's all dark. And then he would paint some main figures that are highly, highly illuminated. And look, everybody has a different expression. And this is what, it, it's, it's called a night watch. So I have another question for you. I'm going to unmute all of you. Now you tell me whether this painting is a daytime painting or a nighttime painting. Nighttime. 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 That's what I thought too. But then, no, it's not. It's actually a procession during the day. It was a procession during the day. They were celebrating a victory over something. So here, these are these two main guys. And this woman here is holding a dead chicken because they said, okay, they defeated somebody in the war or something. There's a rifle over here. And, you know, they are all there. Uh, there is a procession. Um, and... Uh, that's what is being uh, shown over here. It is during the day. You know why it's so dark? So it's dark because it's dark because Rembrandt used a varnish. Once you paint an oil paint, you have to put varnish over it. A varnish is something that is going to protect the pigments of the painting in the back. So the type of varnish he used was actually very dark. And that's why this painting is very dark, okay? So anyway, and plus he has this style where he plays with light and dark, you know? And, um, uh, and on top of that, he put a dark varnish on it. 
and uh, so now it's called the night watch and that's what it's known known by okay we paid like uh, this was commissioned by captain Kokyu, but there were six 17 other people that paid a hundred uh, uh, gildas so at, in those days that was a lot of money a lot of money okay, okay. Uh, i want to tell you some stories about this painting so this painting was tried to, you know, was uh, like uh, the painting was um, damaged by some people. In about like uh, I think in about 1975, uh, and uh, in 19, I'm going to unmute and uh, I'm, I'm going to mute you all. So in about 1975, an unemployed school teacher slashed the painting. And uh, also earlier on, somebody else came and slashed the painting. And it didn't get damaged. You know why? Because um, the varnish was so thick that it protected the painting. But in 1975, it, they damaged it pretty good. But then even though it was, because he, the school teacher, he was unemployed, and he was just going crazy and he came and one day he just slashed the painting. So uh, they restored it, but you know, you will, um, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of sad that that happened. Okay, and in 1990, another patient, he was a psychiatric patient, he came and slashed it. So another wonderful thing about this painting, because it's so big, right? Yeah, you can take a picture of it, but, uh, some scientists wanted to take small pictures. So they took like about 528 pictures of this painting and by a computer program, they put it all together to make it one painting, okay? And the reason why they wanted to do this is because they wanted to study whether, uh, how age of a painting damages the painting. Okay, so that's why in 1990 they is it 1990 or 2020? I think it's actually May. In May 2020, some scientists got like 524 pictures of this painting just to be able to study um, what happens with age in a painting. This is very good. And one other thing that I want to tell you, I know I'm spending a lot of time on this painting, but one other thing about this um, is that Rembrandt never told people about his technique. So, you know, even I don't know much about his technique. How did he paint all these things? How did he get these luminous, uh, you know, paintings? We don't know. So there are, there's much debate going on. Now, here's another painting. This painting is called The Storm on the Sea of Galilee. It was done in 1633. And what is this I'm seeing? It was stolen from Boston. It was stolen. So two people, they disguised as police officers and they went into this Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston and walked out with like 12 other works, including the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Isn't it sad that they would do such a thing because they cannot sell it anywhere because they'll be caught. It's not going to adorn anybody's home because people will know that it's a stolen painting and will report them. So it is hidden in some cellar somewhere. The police are still investigating. And it is kind of sad that this has happened. But in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, you know, you know how you hang these paintings? There is a spot for this painting and it's still empty because they think that one day they will get this painting back. In fact, Somebody said, in fact, somebody made a call to the police or someone saying that we want to return the paintings. And then the call went cold. Nobody ever followed up, you know? So someday we'll find out where these paintings are and hopefully that'll be soon. But it's, it's kind of sad because somebody stole it in 1990, okay? So that's the story. Another a very curious thing about this painting is it's um, from the biblical story, and um, I should, uh, the, the biblical story about how
how Jesus calmed the sea of the storm in the Sea of Galilee. Again, if what do you see over here? See how he has done lights. No, this is lights right here in the middle and darks all around. And this is his only seascape. Seascape meaning like, you know, uh, something to do with the sea. So this was his only seascape. And then look at this painting. It's a self portrait of Rembrandt with two circles. See these circles right here? It's a very famous portrait of him. And do you know how you and I take selfies? A lot of selfies, right? We, uh, how many of you take selfies of yourself? I'm sure a lot of you. I see Dolly's hand going up. Very nice. So in those days, in the 1600s, that's how many years ago? Like 445 some years ago? This man used to do his own selfies. But the only thing is there was no camera. So what did he do? He painted himself and he has painted himself like over 40 times. So we have 40 portraits of uh, Rembrandt. This is an old portrait of Rembrandt. See again, what is he done? What is he doing? He's using dark. These are the dark paint sides of the painting. And then he's illuminated his face. There's light. So he was a master of this technique called chiaroscuro. Okay, chiaroscuro. What is the significance of these what is uh, the of these uh, round circles? We don't know, you know, because he didn't put, he beat, some people thought that it was the globe, the world, but there's no uh, mention of any countries in there. So we don't know what the significance is. Here he's old Rembrandt. And in this particular PowerPoint, I want you all to go back and look at one of the videos that somebody made um, and uh, he, what he did was he took these 40 portraits and showed Rembrandt aging in those 40 portraits. So he painted himself very young and kept on till he became really old. See his old face. It's like, you know, he painted instead of making him look really beautiful and stuff, he painted himself like he is. That's very important to know. Okay. Now, here's another painting. It's called The Conspiracy of, the, of Claudius Civilis. It's in the National Museum in Stockholm, Sweden. So this painting was the largest he ever painted. It's five meters by five meters because uh, the Amsterdam City Council wanted him to paint it for their offices and then they never paid him. So what's he going to do with this large painting? And where did he like, where did he paint this large painting? It definitely was not in his home because it was too large. So there's significant, um, you know, uh, people are wondering where he painted it. Uh, let's ask you guys, what do you think? Okay, unmute everybody. So what do you think? What do you think he paint? Where do you think he painted this large painting? You have to go into it at home, measure out one meter, okay? So then that is five meters by five meters. He painted it on the floor of his house. No, there wasn't enough space. Where did he paint? Like on the know, wall of the street. Outside. On the street, outside, but then the elements, you know, like the elements of uh, rain and stuff like that. Yes, Dolly, you want to say something? Where did you In the museum. In the museum? Yeah, probably the council hall, but probably. So it's good to know that you all um, are thinking of that. So people are thinking maybe he painted there. So um, we don't know. But then the Amsterdam City Council didn't pay that, pay the man. And imagine painting a huge painting, as detailed work as he does, and then you don't get paid for it. That's terrible, you know? And so what did he do? He cut the painting down. This painting, was in the form of a half moon, okay? Which means that, um, like, you know how the moon is round and you cut it in the middle, it's a half moon. So it was a lunette. L a lunette is a half moon. So he cut the painting down and now it stays in the National Museum in Stockholm, Sweden, okay? So that's that story about this painting. The next painting, this is a sam the sampling officials 
So when you look at this painting again, you will find he's using chiaroscuro because there's dark and there's light. Look at all the light, okay? Another thing that he was doing is that he has three planes. Here's one plane, here's another plane, and here's another plane of where the hands are. See? So, and what is he painting? He's painting these officials who are examining this a piece of this carpet. So these were members, they, these were the draper men. The draper officials were elected officials that came in to, um, uh, you know, like weavers would come and give them their cloth and say, uh, you know, uh, judge it, judge it for us. And then if it is of very high quality, they would get lots of seals, like four or five seals. If it's of poor quality, they'd put one seal. So that's what this scene is. And um, uh, it's called the sampling officials. And it's in the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam. Okay. Oh, another uh, important thing about this painting is that this painting is used on packaging on Dutch master cigars. So they put this painting in there. All right, now next, let's look at this. This is another painting of the prodigal son, the return of the prodigal son. And it's in the Hermitage Museum in Russia. So I want to tell you a story about this painting. And the thing is that Rembrandt was really influenced by this painting, uh, the proverb of the prodigal son. Okay, the prodigal son, it's a biblical proverb. It's about forgiveness. The father forgives this uh, young son of his who just spent all his money. There were two sons this father had. And it's a biblical proverb, okay? So what he did was the younger son said, okay, I want to get my share. So the father gave him his share. What did he do? He went off and he spent all his money. And then he became a pauper and he came home. So when he came home, the, old, the oldest son was, you know, he stayed at home. He did what his father asked him to do and everything. But the father, instead of getting angry with his younger son, what did he do? He forgave the son. And he said, he welcomed his son and he cut the fattest cows and had a feast for him. So the older son was really jealous. He said, why did you do that? He went and spent all your money and I'm here doing all your work and uh, you are, you know, you didn't do any feast for me, but you're doing a feast for this useless person who has wasted all your money. So what did the father say? He said, son, you are with me and everything that I have is mine as yours, okay? But this boy was lost and now he's found. So he forgave all the things that the son did and embraced him. See, he's, this is like a very motherly embrace and he's like a father, he's embracing the son. So Rembrandt was really happy um, to, uh, you know, uh, was very, uh, very moved by this prodigal, the return of the prodigal son uh, parable. So he painted it a lot. He did a lot of etchings and so forth. So now look at this, this painting. It's the man with the uh, golden helmet. However, the story about this painting is that it uh, couldn't be Rembrandt's, some people said, okay? And the reason why it couldn't be Rembrandt's is because it doesn't have a style. So uh, they said that maybe his students did this painting. So nowadays they think that this uh, painting is made by his students, okay? Now this painting is another self-portrait. Isn't that something? Self-portrait with beret and turned up collar. Where is it found? It's in the National Gallery in Washington, DC, okay? So uh, here, one of the things like uh, is classic about this painting is that some of the areas, I mean, you can't tell by looking at this picture, 
But if you go, if you have a chance to go to Washington, D.C., go and look up this painting in person. And you will find that some areas are unfinished. Some areas, because it's unfinished because there's a little bit of gray showing, okay? But then some areas, he's done some careless brushwork, okay? And, uh, but it still looks really nice. And then in some areas, over wet paintings, like especially around his face and mustache, he has scratched it up, okay? So he's done all these crazy techniques on this particular painting. So uh, that, uh, that needs our attention. So if you ever have a chance to go to DC, make sure you tell your parents to take you there and then you go see this painting and some others that we are going to talk about in this um, uh, series of uh, lectures. So now this um, next painting is called Belshazzar's Feast. It's uh, made in 1635 and you can see it in the National Gallery in London. So it's a little bit unlike his other works, this particular painting, okay? The palette is very rich. Uh, it has like reds, golden yellows, and um, ochres, and there is some blue in there too. So anyway, so this is, uh, this, is this painting is very different from his other paintings. That's what's um, known about this. And even though I've mentioned here that it is uh, painted in 1635, the exact date is not known and it's debatable whether it was painted in 1635 or somewhere uh, near about 1638. We don't know. The exact date is not known. But we go on to the next painting. So look over here. Remember I told you that um, Rembrandt spent a lot of money he spent a lot of money on different things. Some of the things he spent money on are costumes. So this could be an old man, probably his father, you know, we don't know, but he used his father in a lot of his portraits. And then, or it must be a man from the street or something. And then he painted him with, see this big massive cloak, again, dark, light, dark, okay? Then he put him a big necklace, this big necklace and another necklace on the collar it's, it's like a metal piece right on the collar so these are all costumes that he owned actually when he wasted all his money there was an auction and this auction list is available even to this day and you can see that he collected all sorts of things and uh, to get the money back from either the government or something they um, there's an auction list that showed a lot of his collections so he wasted a ton of money i mean you should do collections but do it within what you can afford don't do it within what you cannot afford right so that's um, that's one of the lessons from rembrandt's life okay this painting is very interesting i have a story to tell you about this so what do you see over here it's actually as the painting's title depicts. It says, it is the anatomy lesson of daughter Nicolae's Tull. Okay, it's in the Mauritius in the Hague, Netherlands. So what do you see here? You see a whole, uh, there is this guy. He's teaching, he's a teacher. He's teaching an anatomy lesson. Okay, and the anatomy lesson is about his, this forearm. And this used to be a public spectacle. Can you imagine like you and I being invited to go to see how a person, a cadaver is being opened up? So anatomy lessons and now the, all these are doctors and they possibly paid Rembrandt to get them in the picture. So they're all studying anatomy of the forearm by this teacher. Now remember, like um, to go to this anatomy lesson, it happened once a year. This is always performed on a criminal who was just executed. This criminal's name, I think was, um, let's see, I forget the criminal's name. But anyway, I'll, I'll send it to you on the email today. But uh, he was just hung and that day, 
And the whole town was called, invited to come see this. So people would dress up to go to, the, to see this anatomy lesson. And they would call a painter. And Rembrandt was only 26 years old, I believe, when he painted this painting, okay? And this would happen once a year. It was a dissection and it was open to the public. Isn't that curious? You know, nowadays, the rule is that even parents, like my daughter goes to medical school and we were allowed to tour um, some of the, uh, the school. But we as parents were not allowed to go into the anatomy building because they wanted to pay respect to the people who have donated their bodies for these students to study on them. So we are not supposed to be, we are not invited into that area. Only students who are medical, uh, who are medical students were allowed to go in there. And there's a reverence to the people who have donated their bodies to study. But in those days, in the 1600s, it was an open spectacle. It was like an event, a social event, and people would go to see, study, you know, the anatomy lesson. That was interesting, I thought. Here is another um, painting. Uh, it's called The Jewish Bride. They don't know whether it's a father and daughter because the, uh, there is a necklace being presented to the bride. She's obviously dressed in red or whether it's a couple. Is it a, um, is it a couple? They don't know who these people are. But I can tell you another story about this. We are going to study Van Gogh sometime, Van Gogh. He came and he said, he just stood in front of the painting and cried. That, that, that's how beautiful he thought this painting was. He just cried and he said, I would give 10 years of my life up and just live on crusts of bread if I can just stand here and watch the painting. Isn't that amazing that an artist would shed tears on the painting by another artist and say that I would give up 10 years of my life and just, if I could just stay here and look at the painting. I think that's very powerful. So it must be a gorgeous, gorgeous painting. So anyway, let's move on to the next painting. This is called the descent from the cross. So, you know, when Jesus was crucified, according to the Bible, he was, you know, he was bringing, uh, this scene is when he was being taken down from the cross. And if you look, Mary is just fainting. And if you look very closely at this painting, everyone, it's a very crowded painting, very crowded, but everybody has a different expression. Everybody is like, you know, expressing very differently you know sort of like a mannerism painting i would say so one of the things that i wanted to tell you about these paintings you know, during the world war um they were being there were a lot of bombings that happened and the hermitage museum was one of those places that they said oh my god if the war you know if there's bombing and stuff, what will happen to all these big paintings? Because we can't move them. Where are we going to store them? So you know what they did at the, in Russia in those days? They built brick walls around paintings. They literally built like a brick walls to uh, you know, protect all these paintings and things like that. And um, once the war was over, everything was uh, restored back and the museum was open in 1945. Let's move on to the next painting. This one is called Aristotle Con Contemplating on a Bust of Homer. It was, uh, it was a commission of Rufo and it's in, uh, at the Met in New York City. The Met, Met is called the Metropolitan Museum in New York City, okay? So that's that. Again, if you look at it, what do you see? Light, lights and darks, lights and darks. This is very characteristic of a Rembrandt painting. Here's another, this is a, the abduction of Europa. It's like a fable, it's a myth. And uh, he decided to do this painting and it's in the Getty Museum in California. Okay, and uh, it has a Baroque style, which is, you know, very ornate because of all the beautiful colors and 
uh, gilded uh, clothing and so forth. So it has some Baroque style in it. But um, yeah, so this was the abduction of Europa. It's, uh, it's on a single oak panel as well. Now let's look at what Rembrandt used to say. This is my favorite part. Okay, let me unmute you. Do you have any questions so far? And when I, you know, when you're done um, with my, you know, the lesson in about another 20 minutes or so, I want you to go back to these PowerPoints because there is a lot of information and I want you to go and research on the internet. Okay, you'll, uh, you'll learn a lot because people spend many, many years learning these things. So I want you to do that. All right, I'm going to mute you again. And this is my favorite part. You know, I love to, to quote um, people and uh, think about, you know, what is it that they like to say? So one of Rembrandt's quotes, and I think it's applicable even today, practice what you know, and it will help you make clear what you now do not know, okay? So painting is the grandchild of nature. If you go outside, everything is perfect, right? Even on a rainy day, it looks beautiful, whether it's sunny, whether it's rain, whether it's snowing, nature looks gorgeous. So according to Rembrandt, painting is the grandchild of nature. And then another thing he said about is that without atmosphere, a painting is nothing. And I think it is so crucial to have atmosphere. You know, like when you go out to eat, you like restaurants that are beautifully decorated. And it is scientifically proven that if you present a plate to eat and it's beautiful, your digestion is amazing, okay? But if you just drop something and you're eating on the run and you're just like biting, your digestion, your body doesn't take it so well, okay? So atmosphere is an important thing, not just in painting, but in life, okay? And then he also said, choose only one master, nature. And he said, a painting is finished when the artist says it's finished. So he's very, he was very certain that, you know, if I say it's finished, it's finished. Okay. And then an honest man, I love this, this saying of his, an honest man always values earning honor over wealth. So his honor was everything. Wealth is nothing, okay? So that's another very good saying of his. And old age is a hindrance. We have some um, older aunties in our class and I just love that they are here with us. Um, old age is a hindrance to creativity, but cannot crush my youthful spirit. So I am still young. Well, I'm 60 years old, to, you know, not two, two days ago or you know, whatever, I don't know, five days ago. I turned 60, but hey, I feel very young. The old age may be a hindrance to some form of creativity, but it cannot crush my youthful spirit. I love that statement. All right, now I'm going to tell you or teach you some terminology. I know some of you are very little, but I know that you might understand and you know try to learn these fancy sounding terms. And so when you go back to school, and your teachers are telling you these things, you will say, oh yeah, that's chiaroscuro. You know, that means it is a technique of using light and dark. And your teacher will be like, what, where did you learn that? So learn these little terms, okay? Chiaroscuro, it's a Italian term, and it's called the technique of using light and dark. Impasto, impasto is, when paint is laid over a canvas or a panel, so it stands out. So you're, so, you know, I know in your kit, I did not uh, introduce you to oil paints because oil paints, you have to be a little bit more careful. But with, you know, paints with acrylic, you can do the impasto technique because acrylic is water soluble. It's, it's safe for young people to work with. That's why uh, I, I just got you some acrylic paints, but not oil paints, okay? So what you do is when you lay paint over a canvas, whether with a brush or a palette knife, one, one of these days I'm going to show you 
how to use a palette knife, okay? And you can do an impasto technique. Then there's a thin glaze applied over. Um, uh, he used to use a thin glaze. So he would take like some type of a thin uh, glaze and apply it over, um, over the painting. Like for instance, he would paint these things with impasto technique. Then he would take a very thin glaze of say red and paint it over these um, things, that, uh, over these paintings that have dried up. And it would give like some uh, red marks in certain areas. That's thin glaze he would uh, do. And then remember I showed you one of the paintings and that I said he did some careless, uh, careless uh, brush strokes. That careless brush stroke is called spreadsatura, spreadsatura. Okay, so I am, uh, you'll learn these little uh, words and use it, you know, and you will sound very, very intelligent. So what was his color palette? He had a very limited color palette. You know, some people use a lot of paint, but this man used very little. He used yellow ochres mostly. He used burnt sienna. He used burnt umber, white, black, and cadmium deep red. Not to say that he didn't use other paint, other colors, but this was his color palette. Okay, and he used these colors a lot. So what was his painting technique? He used very limited color palette. He had dark tones and golden highlights. You could, you could see that. He emphasized face and hands and costume and then set them fading into the dark background. His exact technique is unknown. And he used chiaroscuro, impasto, glaze, and sprezzatura with brilliance. And it made it look so easy. I tried to do it. It's not, it's, it's hard. It's really hard. And again, before I teach you how to use the oil paintings, I'm, I'm in pastels, what we're going to do is um, let's try. Okay, these are the things you can do. We are going to use this. Uh, use this, uh, try to uh, watch this video and it'll show you some oil pastel techniques. Okay. References to watch. This is the reference I wanted you to watch. It's called uh, Rembrandt Self Portrait by Lemur Hart. This guy has a YouTube channel and he put these 40 portraits of Rembrandt from young to old and he transformed it so you could see all his selfies or portraits that he did over a period of years from a young man to an old, old man. Definitely watch this. I think it's a beautiful video. So what can you do with your uh, palettes? You can make a self-portrait like Rembrandt did. How do you do that? Take a picture of yourself. Ask your mom to take a picture of you. Take it in different lightings, you know, and then pick one that you really like and go ahead and try to paint it. You may not be able to paint an exact liking of you, the exact likeness of you, but it's okay. You're going to start learning how to paint, okay? You could paint a landscape maybe, all right? Or you could paint a still life. I'll send you some pictures and you can choose from there or create your own, okay? And before uh, I start painting, we just I just wanted to tell you that the painting in the background is mine and it's called Rhapsody in Gray. And this has won a few awards and it's, um, it's actually in a, uh, in a big company uh, in, in Eaton, Ohio. It's a multinational company. So I'm going to start painting this one. Let's try to paint this uh, storm on the Sea of Galilee. The one thing I, wanna, I want to tell you as a, as a teacher is that if you paint this painting and you say, this is my painting, this is my idea, it's called plagiarism. Don't ever do that, okay? When you take somebody's photograph or somebody's picture and you paint it and you pass it off as your own, that is wrong. So if you take somebody's picture and you paint it, you give the phot photographer credit. Say, this is this particular person's photograph and I painted it because I loved that photograph. Give credit to the photographer. That's the nice thing to do. Never pass off any work that is not yours. Say, supposing your aunt or your mom or your dad, 
does this painting for you. Somebody gives you homework and uh, your mom or dad or aunt or uncle or brother or sister do that homework for you and you pass it off to your teacher as your own. That's a lie. You should not never do that. Okay. So if you, if you, if your mom or somebody helped you acknowledge that they helped you, it's very in, in the U S it is particularly uh, looked down upon and it's considered a serious crime when you're a student, if you're taking somebody else's work and passing it off as, as your own, never ever do that. Okay. So now we're, we're tr going to try to use this. So let's, uh, let's, Take your, take your canvas board. And then one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is remember in the very first uh, PowerPoint, I said, you know, there is the rule of thirds. I'm going to revisit it. What is the rule of thirds? Let's look at it. So if I were to uh, divide this painting into three, let me. Let me just uh, take out a pastel. Let's take out this pastel and, and see how I'm going to divide it approximately into three. Okay, here's one. But in, in your home, make sure you take a ruler, measure it. This is an eight by 10 panel, divided into three equal parts. Put a little dot, okay? And put a little dot over here. You're going to divide it into three. Okay, so put a little dot, like how I showed you over here. So just put a little dot. And then if you put an imaginary line, you know, uh, through there, and if you put like your main subject in between those lines, it's supposed to be a very pleasing painting. So let's look at this storm in the Sea of Galilee, okay? So if you if you put it so the main subject, the main subjects are in a certain like if I draw lines, it's in a certain box. So here's the main subject, right? All this this is the main subject, right? And they in this particular painting uses the rule of thirds, okay, very well. So when you draw something, put it in in on the planes of the lines or in between a certain area so that it looks pleasing to the eye. So here I've taken a dark, the darkest oil pastel you have. So let's see, what you can do is you can copy that painting and just put a lot of darks right here. Go ahead and put the dark pastel right here. Can you see it? So put the dark pastel, you'll, you'll, you'll take time. Put some dark pastel here. And when you're using the pastel pencil, it's like an oil paint, only it's in the form of a pencil, okay? So there are different kinds of pastel pencils. The ones that you've got is the oil pastel. Oil pastel has oil color in it, whereas the other pastels have gum arabic in it. So that's different. It has a different texture than the oil pastel. So uh, get some blue, fill it in somewhere over here. You can draw like a boat. So let's see, I'll, I'll just show you. So you can see that one of these, like right, starting right here, the mast of the painting is going this way draw it. Okay, then here it comes another. And then here comes another. 
here comes another like that. And then here is the sale. And here is the sale. Okay. So you have like a little structure going on. Then you just draw the boat. So if here's the mast, your boat is going to be somewhere around here. And it goes up. Right? That's it. You draw a little bit of that. And then here you can color it in a little bit because it's dark. See? Okay. And then slowly go ahead and you can use your fingers. See? You can use your fingers to make it shaded like that. Okay, and then slowly add the blues. Let me see if I can get the blues. So there's a blue, a little bit of blue little bit of blue. You can use your shading techniques, even with the oil paintings. Introduce a little bit of blue, and then just follow the painting of the Sea of Galilee. See if you can reproduce it. And don't worry about whether it looks like the Sea of Galilee, okay? Don't worry about it. Just do your interpretation of the Sea of Galilee. So I see a little bit of blue here. It's kind of bluish grayish. So I'll put that in right here. Okay, and slowly build the painting. I see some yellows here. Let me see if I can get some yellows. Oh, I'll have to open up another box. So I don't wanna waste your time. But see, that that's the way you slowly start building the painting. Find out where the colors are and slowly build the painting. Okay, like that. Can you see it? You see it? So, you know, and I'm painting it. This is not the right way to paint it. You paint it, you know, either on the easel or like on, on flat on the surface and you have better control. So you, what I'm trying to just show you is just build a painting by the colors you see and the shapes you see and start building it and see where you go okay so that's that i'm going to unmute all of you do you guys have any questions so uh, again one more thing about plagiarism right um so if i'm going to draw i'm going to reproduce the sea of galilee uh, I can't tell it, you know, I, uh, I'll have to say that if this is a reproduction of Rembrandt's Sea of Galilee, and uh, it's done by me because it's a study. So you can say that it's a study of Rembrandt's Sea of Galilee, and I painted it, and then you can sign your name, okay? That's uh, one thing. Anybody ha has any questions for me? Excuse me? Yes? Um I didn't get the email with the PowerPoint coaching lesson or I can't hear you, so will you be a little more clearer? The email sent out yesterday, I did not receive it. Oh, what's the email? Tell me okay. again, because one of the emails came back. Oh, should I type it or do you want me to fill it out? Uh, no, uh, say it out loud. Okay. P R U. No, 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 I can't hear you. So type it out on the chat, please. Okay. Uh, chat, okay. Okay, I see a lot of, yeah, I can't see anything. 
but I showed you the picture a little bit up close, you know? So did you see it that time? Did you see when I held it up close? Did you? Trust in the Lord all time at gmail.com. So let me unmute all of you again. Let's see. Participants. Red lights, how much you have on the dock? Green light means. Yeah. So uh, is, there, uh, is there any question? Did you see what? Oh, there. Somebody is already drawing Madison. Show us your photo. So show us your painting. There you go. Yeah, there you go. You're developing the painting. Good. 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 Make sure when you're doing the black, dark background that it doesn't, like, make sure you leave the area that is supposed to be a little illuminated white so that you can put the yellows so it becomes illuminated, okay? Because if you put the black on there, it won't show. The yellow on top will become a little muddy. Okay, so uh, be sure to, in case uh, this particular canvas that you're uh, painting on doesn't come out right, go ahead and use another canvas. So you learn from your mistakes on this canvas. Okay. All right, anybody else has any questions? Abigail, you have any questions? Do Dolly, I'll come to you in a minute. No questions? Dolly, what's your question? Are we painting this boat or are we painting any landscape? You can do any landscape you like. I mean, I was just suggesting let's copy this painting. One, because it was stolen. One, because it's a pretty, um, you know, it's, an, it's, it's a landscape that you can do. Uh, it's a boat with some people in it. I mean, it's not, by no means am I saying that it's an easy landscape to paint. It is a difficult one. You can paint whatever you like. You can do a still life. You can do uh, a landscape, or a scenery that you chose. You can do your own portrait, but use those light and dark techniques like how Rembrandt used and put it. It may not be perfect, but you will get the idea. Does that make sense? Yes. Abigail, yeah. Yeah, you have any... A, How come I'm not able to unmute you? I'm not able to unmute you, but okay. um, anyway. But did you guys, uh, can, you, uh, can you write it on the chat? Let me see. Participants, I don't know why I'm not able to unmute you. Oh, there you are. Yeah, now I can hear you, Abigail. Go ahead. Uh, are you? Uh, did you have a question? Oh no, no. Okay, that's good. So um, go ahead and uh, uh, start doing this painting. I know yesterday I got a lot of paintings, which is I'm so happy about. So I'm gonna put this, put that up today in my PowerPoint, and I will send you an email with, with the next PowerPoint, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank Have a you, good Arjun. day, everybody. Thank you. Everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Aunties, I Bye. wanted to talk. Bye -bye. Bye. 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 Aunties, I wanted to talk to you guys about. Okay. Please. Yes. Do you um do you guys want me to show you some extra um techniques maybe someday not today because we had to go out somewhere but uh after that after sunday 
uh, after a few days yeah yeah try to uh, try to use the uh, oil pastels okay um yeah. sure. and uh, i need to i need to map out what like i i was trying to draw this okay but it didn't come out any you know nothing yeah that's okay but it is so, coming out, it's coming out pretty decent what you're doing is correct like you know you draw you drew the main uh structure like how you just showed me that's good and then slowly develop the shapes around it that's what i you know so it didn't come out i know it is nothing you but know. <laughs> I okay. need to know the measurements like I can't figure out in my head right how big it should be this way and how big it should be this way how to put the men there yes so up you know what you can do is you can um take a ruler and a pencil and then just uh, you know print out this painting like if you can print it out that's fine otherwise you can just put it on the screen and then measure it with the uh, with your ruler or from the screen and then put it on your paper. Oh, you can so. do that too. But uh, what about painting? Where I will get it? It's in your kit. Okay. It's in your kit. See? Let me show you. These pastels. Yeah. Yeah. Eva Joanna? Yeah. These are the pastels we're using. Mm -hmm. These are oil pastels. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is the other block that I use. Which one are the oil pastels? These, these. These right here. Ye wale just sticks hai na? Ye wale. Huh? Ye wale. Huh? These are the oil pastels. Ye wale. But painting kahan se lenge? I stand today. I didn't understand anything. Hamare <laughs> kit. Today, I didn't understand anything. oil pastel Yeah, it is there. Is there water oil Yeah, it is there. oil These tubes are look like crayons. These are oil pastel. Oil paint concept. Yeah, oil, oil pastel. pastel. The oil crayons pastel. are oil paints. Yeah, oil I pastels. They are called yeah. oil pastels. Yeah. And Hyson paint, say, wo, uh, jo picture say, yeah, no, me. Both key, koi bhi. Wo kahan se lenge hum? Hum aapko kuch bhejte hain. Aaj ke, uh, what do you call it? I'll send you these pictures. Kuch Haan, good pictures bhejna. yeah i will send you some ideas to paint okay yeah sure uh, and then you can do that so um that you know like uh, the oil pastels the reason why i did not do oil paints is because oil paints are a little bit difficult for beginners especially children Correct. because you know, yeah, I know. Yeah, because it's very uh, dangerous, some of the turpentine and all that. But oil pastels will look like oil paints, but yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. crayons, okay? And yeah, you I can use it as, yeah. I got this. Yeah. So that's what you were talking about. I did not know. Yes. Kusum, why did you not understand my lecture today? What happened? Huh? Kusum? Kusum? Yes. Yes, you said you didn't understand today. Yeah. How to paint? I I am not sure I can do it. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me show you again. One more time. So, if you take can you see this now? Yes. 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 yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you look at the Sea of Galilee painting, what did I do? <laughs> Take your darkest color and yes. put it down here. Mm -hmm. It's dark. It's dark up, up here. Put oh. some dark. You know, so just block in the dark areas. Mm -hmm. Then I took like the dark crayon and I put like a mask from here to here. Right from here to here. 
right? Look. So look. that is the structure of my painting. So then you look at your painting again. I'll send it to you again in my email. Okay. So you'll have a big picture. You can click on it and see it very clearly. Okay. And then you just put this little mark right here. Okay. Right? And then you uh, draw the sail. Then the draw the boat cast structure. See this boat cast structure? Uh -huh. And then it goes up. But you go up. Like you don't do uh, deconstruct the uh, the painting. So do small regions. Like okay, right here there's some blue. Right here. So I put some blue marks. But you take your time and put some blue mark. Then right next to the blue mark, if you look at it, there'll be some orangish clouds. So okay. to your pastel, look at those orangish clouds, pull that in. Okay. So like that, if you do small regions, you know, small, small regions, it will be it'll be easier. You deconstruct it easier. So first you start from all the dark background. Okay. Dark background. Okay. Uh -huh. and Slowly put in like up a structure now hai, like ye jo, like this uh, uh -huh. there. You put uh -huh. that, you put this mask in, then uh -huh. uh, and leave this area empty for now. But fill in everything else. You know? Okay. Yeah, okay. fill in oh, yeah. Fill in all these things, then slowly okay. come here, down here, and add the lightest lights. Like mm -hmm. jo, jo sabse light uh, low hai. you don't mm -hmm. have to be perfect. Just put an impression of it. Just mm -hmm. put an impression of okay, mujhe yahan pe yellow nazar aa raha hai. Like you know, put mm -hmm. yellow there. Yahan pe mujhe uh, thoda sa blue nazar aa raha hai. Ya thoda sa brown. Look at your pastel colors the, in that kit. It's really nice. So you put those pastel colors in. And then what happens is then you develop the painting. That'll be your first layer, right? Then mm -hmm. what you do is once your first layer is done, then you take back. Now you know where all the colors should go, right? Here it's dark, but see over here, there's a lot of space. So I will mm -hmm. go back and I'll color it in so that it is a little bit more darker and darker. Mm -hmm. Then you take a little, what you call it, a tissue like this. And if you want to spread it, mm -hmm. just do this. See? See what it does to it? So that way you're going to cover all the areas. But okay. leave the light regions for the light colors and do okay. it one step at a time. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. oh wow, Will, let me see. That's beautiful. Very nice. Very nice. You drew a castle. Good job. Good Sorry, job. Uh, like a few Good job. Very nice. So that's, that's that'll be amazing. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much again. Thank, Thank you, Hassan. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you so very much.